Bill Gates co-founded Microsoft nearly 50 years ago at the forefront of the computer age that changed the world. And since then, he's been using the fortune that earned him to change the world. The Gates Foundation giving away tens of billions of dollars over the past decade. He almost also famously predicted the world was unprepared for a pandemic in a 2015 TED Talk that was unfortunately accurate and has been viewed now 43 million times. Well, he's sounding the alarm again this morning. His new book, How to Prevent the Next Pandemic, is out today. It's also been a year of upheaval in his own life after he and Melinda, his wife of 27 years, announced their divorce one year ago today. So, Bill, we have so much to catch up on. It's good to see you. Good morning. Good to see you. Well, I, I think this is the definition of what they call a hard sell. You're, you're out here promoting a book, How to Prevent the Next Pandemic, and you know people are sick and tired of hearing about the pandemic. Uh, they have COVID fatigue. Why is this the moment to have this conversation? Well, I don't want us to wait uh, until we forget about how awful this has been. I mean, we've had tens of millions of deaths, you know, trillions of dollars of economic loss, education loss, mental depression. Uh, and with a few key steps, we can make sure this won't happen again. There's something strangely optimistic about this <laughs> book. You've got a whole bunch of ideas on how to actually prevent the next pandemic. One idea, you, you compare it to firefighters. We need kind of a global firefighting team that's ready to uh, find the next pandemic and respond to it. How would it work? Well, in firefighting, we're all trained to know that, you know, there's the exit. Uh, we, the U.S. alone has over 300,000 full-time firefighters. So we take it seriously because if one house burns down, it can, uh, you know, affect an entire community. Pandemics are even worse. And we didn't practice. We weren't ready to go. A few countries that were more ready, uh, like Australia, have 10 percent the deaths that we have. So... Uh, the debate about exactly how to invest in that preparedness now is the right time, even though we're still trying to get out of this one. Yeah, you've argued that basically pandemics, um, disease is inevitable, but pandemics are not. And if you spend billions now, you save trillions <laughs> later. Is that a pretty good summary of the book? Yeah, big, me, big return. Tell me about, um, you, you have this germ team that you propose. We have the World Health Organization. Why isn't that enough? Well, they're not funded, actually, uh, to go to countries and practice. They're not funded to fly in where there's an outbreak. Uh, so they need about a billion a year, 3,000 more people that would stay dedicated to pandemics. You know, pandemics don't come very often, so it's easy to, to take your personnel and go work on other things. And here, we'd make sure that this team had those skills and was always practicing. By the way, in some ways, we were lucky with this pandemic. It certainly could have been a more contagious virus, and it could, could have been more lethal. Yeah, the lethality, uh, you know, ends up being about 0.3%. Uh, smallpox is 30%. So this is not the worst case, all the more reason to make these investments in preparedness. When you look at how the U.S. and the world responded to COVID-19, whether it's masks or vaccines or shutdowns, closures, it's become so political. I wonder if, if it happened again, if it was March 2020 all over again with COVID-19, would we even be able to mount as effective a response as we did last time around? It's been so politicized. Yeah, it's unfortunate that... Uh, we didn't get trusted voices in both parties talking about the benefit of masks and vaccines uh, so that it wasn't a political issue. I think everybody does support the health workers who are heroes. Uh, I think they support the innovation where we got the vaccine out faster uh, than ever before. And that has saved millions of lives. Even that vaccine, we can make a better one where you never get infected. Uh, uh, so... You know, innovation, uh, like in many areas, is where I see a potential for a consensus and for avoiding most of the damage. Yeah, the book, if you want to geek out on some of the innovations <laughs> and where the technology is, a vaccine you can inhale, a pan vaccine, it's in there. But let's talk about misinformation, because that has been a hallmark, unfortunately, of this pandemic. President Biden rather famously said last July that misinformation on social media is killing people. Do you agree? Absolutely. Uh, it's been weird that, you know, vaccines have been attacked as, you know, being overall net negative or there's some conspiracy here. It's terrible. Well, some of it affects you. You're, yeah, you're part of these conspiracy theories. That is a very weird thing that just because I support vaccines to save millions of lives, people are saying, no, I, 
you know, I make money from vaccines or that I'm trying to, you know, cause death or track or uh, a lot of strange stuff. Um, hard to understand why that is. Well, you know, misinformation is obviously a big issue that a lot of folks like you are worried about. Elon Musk just recently announced moves to acquire Twitter. I wonder if you are concerned about the proliferation of misinformation, given some of his views about expanding what he refers to as free speech on Twitter and what you think of the acquisition. Well, the digital realm has facilitated, you know, kind of interesting but wrong ideas spreading very quickly. And we need to innovate so that digital realm is more of a positive thing of getting the truth out and that people are seeing, hey, this is false. Do you worry um, about Elon Musk? Well, Elon, uh, you wouldn't want to underestimate Elon. What he did at Tesla is amazing, helping with climate change, what he did at SpaceX, uh, you know, Will he this time uh, make that improvement? You know, should there be laws that strike a better balance of uh, free speech versus, you know, conspiracy theories confusing people? Um, you know, Elon thinks he can improve Twitter. Well, I don't I don't know specifically what he'll do, but, uh, you know, it it. It is, uh, there's an opportunity and we need innovation in that space. Well, let's talk about you personally. It's been a period of transition. It was actually one year ago today that you and your wife, Melinda, filed for divorce. How have you been coming to terms with this? Well, the divorce is definitely a, a sad thing. Uh, you know, I have responsibility for causing a lot of pain to my family. Um, you know, it was a tough year. I feel good that uh, all of us are moving forward now. You know, my oldest got married. Uh, Melinda and I are, you know, continuing to work together. So, um, you know, it, it was sad and tragic, but, uh, you know, now we're, we're moving together. Yeah, she did an interview recently, and she talked about times in her marriage. She said she was lying on the floor crying. Um, what was it like for you to hear that and to hear it publicly? Well, this was a a very tough thing. We had a, a lot of amazing things in our marriage, the kids, the foundation, uh, the enjoyment we had. Uh, and so it's a very hard adjustment. Uh, you know, I know divorces are different, but, uh, you know, just a complete change. You know, we were partners. We kind of grew up together. Um, and now that that's different. We're not married. Frankly, there were allegations of extramarital affairs. And when she was asked about that in the interview, she said, that is a question that Bill needs to answer. So here you are now. <laughs> Did that happen? Were you unfaithful in your marriage? Is that one of the reasons there was a divorce? I certainly made mistakes and I, I take responsibility. I don't think delving into the particulars at this point is, is constructive. But yes, uh, I um, caused pain and I, I feel terrible about that. What have you learned from that? I mean, you, you were someone who has this voracious appetite for knowledge, and divorce is an experience that can be um, a journey to learning something about yourself and change, hopefully. What have you learned about yourself? Mm. Uh, you know, they, there's areas like climate or, you know, health where I, I have expertise and on personal matters like this, I, I'm, you know, I, I don't think of myself as an expert. I, uh, should be very humble about, you know, success, uh, you know, has a, a tricky aspect to it. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't have great advice for other people. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you about Jeffrey Epstein. Melinda, Melinda mentioned that that was one of the strains, your relationship with him. And, um, you know, why? I guess the question is real simple. I mean, why did you continue to meet with him? When you met him, he was already a convicted sex offender. Um, you know, and do you regret that? I certainly made a huge mistake, uh, not only meeting him in the first place, but uh, I met with him a number of times. Uh, I had a goal of raising money for global health. I didn't realize that you know, meeting with him almost downplayed uh, the incredibly awful things he did. You know, I learned more about that over time, but uh, you know, I'd add that to the list of big mistakes, including you know where Melinda's advice was sound, and I I should have followed it sooner than I did.
And you never saw anything where you thought, this doesn't feel right. Linda kind of had a visceral reaction the first time she met him. No, he was a, a bad person. Uh, and, you know, uh, I had a reason that I thought those meetings would lead to something good, but uh, I shouldn't have done them. And finally, on this topic, you recently gave an interview. You said you'd marry Melinda all over again. Um, she says you guys are <laughs> friendly, um, not necessarily friends, but friendly. How do you see the relationship moving forward? Well, one of the things we built together is, is the Gates Foundation, and we love that work. Uh, you know, we've got all the resources I was lucky enough to get. We've got Warren Buffett uh, committed uh, massive resources. And so making sure that is spent well, saves lives. Melinda and I love doing that work together. So I feel very lucky that I, I still have that with her, as well as, you know, we've got these three incredible kids. I know. And I heard they're all moving out of the house. <laughs> so you're, you're an empty nester for sure now. I've got a big empty nest. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Bill. Thank you so much. Thanks for being with us. And again, the book is called How to Prevent the Next Pandemic, chock full of ideas. It's out today. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Find your favorite recipes, celebrity interviews, uplifting stories, shop our favorite deals, and so much more with the Today app. Download it now.